Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Roini. Today we are going to study about some of the important uh, aspects in anatomy through MCQs. It's going to be a rapid quiz, rapid MCQ, where uh, you're going to get some explanation as well. That way you are going to get gain maximum out of this MCQ session. So we'll start it in a bit. Okay. All right, we'll see the first question. We have uh, many participants watching. Okay, so let's see whether you are. Uh... All right, so here I just want to give you a glimpse of what you can expect from me, who I am. I'm Dr. Rohini. I have about 10 years of teaching experience, teaching UG, PG level. So that is also including the USMLE lab, MCI, and especially our NEET aspirants. Okay, so these are some of the competitive exams I have uh, taught the students. And that is because I have an experience of about 10 plus years teaching in USA as well as in India. So this gives me a exposure to various kind of questions like what is asked in USMLE exams, what is asked in PLAB, MCI, NEET, I can get a hold on those things. So I would suggest that you follow me to get maximum out of these MCQ sessions. So you can follow, you can subscribe. Ro Aqua, R-O-H, A-Q-U-A. My name is Dr. Rohini and uh, my classes are at 6 p.m. 7.30, that is special class. This is special class. And there is one at uh, 9.30, which is again at this time, that is on YouTube. So this includes most of the times it is MCQs, 7.30 is also MCQs and this includes a topic discussion. So that will be a topic which we are going to discuss. Like I have discussed on now various topics like the brachial plexus, injuries of brachial plexus and then various cartilages, the bones we have discussed and then joints, then the blood supply of upper limb we have discussed, all these special you know, topics we have discussed and that will be daily at 6 p.m. So you please look out for all these topics. Once you have your uh, knowledge upgraded, you can easily answer the MCQs. So let's move on to the MCQs now because it is 9.30 session and please follow, subscribe and the more the followers, we get motivated to do even better. All right, so we have... The first question, the question number is uh, not put. You will have to just answer what is what it is, whether it is A, B or C. The question says the cricothyroid is supplied by. Okay, cricothyroid is supplied by which now? Okay, Sanjay name is present and there are some random guys and we have Hare Krishna. And uh, he says, Hare Krishna says, B. So now, cricothyroid is, what is the function of cricothyroid, first of all? Cricothyroid, what is the function? We have various muscles that are present in larynx. Now, these are some of the laryngeal muscles. So, larynx has got various muscles. So, Cricothyroid is an important muscle which helps in tenses the vocal cord. And this is the only muscle that is supplied by 
B that is external laryngeal. Rest all are supplied by recurrent laryngeal. All other muscles. All other muscles are supplied by recurrent laryngeal except cricothyroid which is supplied by external laryngeal. Now what are the branches of the vocal cord? Let's see. He says B. Most of you say it's B. Okay, let's see. So this is how the vocal cord and other things, the explanation I can give you. There is pharyngeal branch. There is superior laryngeal nerve that divides into external and internal. Internal is also called recurrent laryngeal. So recurrent laryngeal nerves supplies all muscles. And external laryngeal is the only one which supplies the cricothyroid muscle. So you can see that is the only muscle which supplies the cricothyroid muscle. Okay, only no. All right, so that is one thing. Now here you can see that to get more information, you can see that it emerges out of the jugular foramen. You can see there is superior and inferior ganglion and see how it takes origin from the pons. You can see all this nuclei. Okay, this is very, very important. Nucleus, ambiguous, very, very important. This is of the vagus now. So motor supply is by nucleus ambiguous. So now what we are talking is motor supply. So nucleus ambiguous, it takes origin from and then it comes down and it exits out through jugular foramen. And then you can see that it gives the pharyngeal branch. This is the branch we are talking about. And it supplies most of the muscles of the pharynx, soft palate, except for Stylopharyngeus. Stylopharyngeus is supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve. And another muscle that is tensor valley palatini that is supplied by a different nerve that is from the trigeminal. That is mandibular branch. So this is very important thing to remember. What are the things supplied by vagus? Then it has so many branches. It gives out superior laryngeal and recurrent laryngeal is another branch from the superior laryngeal. So you can see that there is bronchial plexus, cardiac plexus, celiac plexus and mesenteric plexus formed because of the vagus Now, So this is a very, very important slide to remember. Okay, next one. Okay, so we have another one. We have another slide which says, this is the branches. You have lingual branch, tonsillar, inferior alveolar. Lingual. This is inferior laryngeal is nothing but recurrent laryngeal. This is one thing you have to remember. Recurrent laryngeal is same as this inferior laryngeal. Okay. So, vagus dividing into achieves a branch called external Okay, through this it supplies cricothyroid muscle. Next, we'll go to the next one. Okay, who can answer this? We have a uh, lot of people. We have uh, okay, vocal cord movements is abduction, adduction. There is only one muscle which does abduction. Anybody knows vocal cord? Somebody is asking about vocal cord. Sanjay, you asked about vocal cord. There is only one which does abduction that is posterior cricothyroid. Okay. 
okay next this question come to this question which of the following structure is derived from third pharyngeal arch now there is first pharyngeal arch second third we have fourth and we have sixth there is no fifth there is no fifth is not there so you tell me what is the answer for this one okay the third pharyngeal arch is it these things which are the structure that is derived from third pharyngeal arch he says the answer is lesser cornua of the hyoid bone so we'll see the answer so this is the one so this is the third pharyngeal arch and it gives rise to it is actually the greater cornua and lesser cornua present so hyoid part that is parts of the hyoid so parts of the hyoid bone that is lesser cornua is given by the third arch this gives rise to greater cornua very very important okay. next one okay next one we'll move on to the question the middle meningeal artery now you tell me middle meningeal artery now you think of the middle meningeal artery it is also looped by a nerve which nerve is that that is the auriculotemporal nerve actually it loops around the middle meningeal artery so middle meningeal artery is a branch from the maxillary so from neck it goes to the towards the brain in the sense it supplies the meninges so it enters which foramen okay middle meningeal artery so now which foramen it enters it enters through foramen spinosum spinosum and the answer is is it it passes through pterygopalatine fossa no so some of you have said a i am not sure whether it is for this question hari krishna says a raj patel says a is it for this question i don't know whether it is for this question they said a Bishop says A again. No, it is not the one which passes through telecopalatine fossa. Posterior division crosses the terion. Is it true? It contributes to circle of Willis. It's not true. It is the anterior division that crosses the terion. That is one thing. And then there is this another um. Okay, then there is this another one. that says it's a branch of maxillary artery is it true is this the answer branch of maxillary artery so it could be the branch of maxillary artery okay let's see it could be this one the branch of maxillary artery it is a b c d this is d so this is the answer which part of maxillary artery hari krishna do you know whether it is the first part second part or the third part which part gives rise to this middle meningeal artery any idea i would remember the first part branches as the my second one has muscular branches muscles of mastication third part has p a g p a s this is the mnemonic this is the mnemonic for this okay so this one we are talking about m so it is from the first part of the maxillary artery Okay, I hope I'm clear. Yes, it is the first part. 
He replies, it is first part. Okay, next one. See, sometimes one more thing is important. It is not always the middle meningeal artery passes through foramen spinosum. See, this is the foramen spinosum here. So, there is rotentum. Then there is ovale. And then comes the spinosum. There are three here in this rank. Sometimes the spinosum is absent. In that case, from where does this the middle meningeal artery enter? So you can see that it enters through the orbital fissure. So you can see that orbital fissure, superior orbital fissure. This is the other detour for this artery. So, if this foramen is absent, in many cases it could be absent. So, in case it is absent, then it enters through superior orb orbital fissure. So, this is a very important thing to be noted. So, many times it has been asked in NEAT. Okay, next one. Okay, let's see if there is anyone who has uh, got questions to ask. Okay, next question, we'll move on to the next one. The oculomotor nerve innervates. So, lateral rectus, is it lateral rectus? Anybody who knows the innervation of the extra ocular muscles? SO4, LR6, 3. So we are talking about the oculomotor, which is 3. SO4 is superior oblique. It is by trochlear. LR6 is by lateral rectus, which is sixth one, that is abducent. The third one is oculomotor nerve. So it innervates the lateral rectus. It forms the apparent limb of accommodation reflex, carries parasympathetic fibers to dilator pupillae. Is it true? Is this the one? Is this the one? Anybody? Anybody who knows the answer? Who is aware of this particular answer? Okay, Krishna says it is D. It passes through medial wall of the cavernous sinus. It is the shortest cranial nerve. It carries parasympathetic fibers to dilator pupillae. It passes through medial wall of the cavernous sinus. Yes, this is the answer. So, all other answers are wrong. This is not the answer. This is not the answer. It passes through cavernous sinus. So, in the cavernous sinus, we have two things in the wall. That is, see, this is the cavernous sinus. We have So, this is intercavernous sinus. Then we have the pituitary gland where we have also the optic chiasma in front. And then this is the pituitary fossa. And here this is the lateral wall. And here we have two structures. One is the carotid artery, internal carotid artery. And other one is oculomotor nerve. So, this is the oculomotor nerve. So, this is the medial wall. And you can see the oculomotor nerve in the median wall. So, it passes through the cavernous sinus. So this is cavernous sinus. This is the right and the other side cavernous sinus. So, all these things are present. Alright, next one. So, you can see that this is the uh, supply of the cavernous uh, the oculomotor nerve. You can see that it is located in the midbrain. And it is uh, parasympathetic fibers are through Edinger-Westphal nucleus. And then it passes through 
the cavernous sinus and then you can see that it enters the orbital fissure then it passes through the tendinous ring where it gives superior division and it gives an inferior division. Superior division supplies la levator palpebrae and superior rectus. Inferior division supplies inferior oblique, medial rectus and inferior rectus. So this is very important. So these two are together. Okay. So now here it also has this ciliary ganglion where the fibers rest. So you can see ciliary ganglion. This is associated with the muscle, uh, the nerves that supply the eyeball. So, oculomotor is associated with the ciliary ganglion. Okay, next one. Considering the damage to spinal accessory nerve, which of the following statement is correct? So, damage to spinal accessory nerve. So, please see the question. Which statement is correct? The spinal accessory nerve is damaged. What will happen? So, it may follow fracture of spinoid bone. Has it got anything to do with the spinoid bone? No, it has got nothing to do with the spinoid bone. It results in weakness on turning the head to the ipsilateral side. Is this correct? On the same side. Is it same side or the opposite side? It should be the opposite side. It is not the same side. It should be the opposite side. So this is the wrong word they have used. It results in winging of scapula. Winging of scapula is by which one? Winging of scapula is by long thoracic nerve damage long thoracic nerve damage. Okay, many of you say it is uh, C or E. So, this is not C. No. And then no. There is risk at central venous catheterization of the internal jugular vein. So, central venous catheterization has uh, nothing to do with the spinal accessory because we will be doing that with the subclavian. Okay, this is the choice of vein that is used. Subclavian vein. So, it is nowhere close to spinal accessory. Okay, next one may occur following a stab wound to the posterior triangle. Why we are talking about posterior triangle here? Because one of the content of posterior triangle is spinal accessory. You don't have to worry about the muscles. We are not talking about muscles here. We are talking about the nerve itself. The nerve is present in the posterior triangle as one of the content. That's why if there is a stab wound to the posterior triangle, it can damage the spinal accessory nerve. Then what can happen to the patient? The patient can have the patient may experience difficulty in shrugging. Hence the shoulders will be drooped. This is the answer. So you can see this spinal accessory nerve here. You can see that it exits out through the jugular foramen along with the vagus. Along with the vagus and glossopharyngeal. And you can see that it how it passes through and uh, how it exits out. All that you can see. This is the spinal accessory. Okay, next one. The spinal accessory nerve can damaged, can get damaged at various levels. This is another important explanation. One is in the cervical spinal cord where the fibers originate. There itself it can get damaged. 
and another one is where it passes through the jugular foramen. So here jugular foramen is formed in the petrous part of the temporal bone, right? And occipital bone posteriorly. So it is a small gap between these two bones. Now fracture of either the temporal bone or the occipital bone can damage the spinal accessory nerve. So now here there is this syndrome that is called Wernert. V R N E Wernert's syndrome. which is also called jugular foramen syndrome where a lesion can happen and that can compress the nerves that exit out. So which are the nerves? 9th, 10th and 11th cranial nerves. So this is the nerves and it has this. Together they have various syndromes. One is to do with the glossopharyngeal, another one to do with the vagus that is with the voice, hoarseness of voice. And glossopharyngeal gag reflex is lost. Okay, gag reflex is lost. And then 11th, what will happen? The shoulder, the shoulder will droop down. Because of the supply to the spine, the shows, the shoulder muscles, that is the sternocleidomastoid and trapezius is lost. So because of this, combined you know syndrome combined symptoms we can call this as Wernicke's syndrome it's a very very important thing to remember Wernicke's syndrome what is the other name for this jugular foramen syndrome okay next one okay next one we'll see if there is any question from the students Okay, everyone has been only answering. Now, which is the longest cranial nerve? Now, there are cranial nerves, which is the longest? So, read the question properly. They are not asking about the cranial course. They are not talking about cranial course. They have not mentioned whether it is intracranial or uh, extracranial. They have not mentioned. So, they are only asking which one is the longest cranial nerve. So it starts somewhere and goes on and on. So who is the vagabond? Who is the vagabond now? We can mention that. Anybody, anybody who wants to answer? Yes, Hare Krishna has been very active. What about others? We have a um, lot of students watching, but not many are attempting. That is, uh, we have Rishabh, we have uh, Sanjay and... Uh, Yes, Raj Patel, what happened? Okay, the longest one is the vagus nerve. Okay, let's see the answer. The vagus nerve is the longest nerve because, the, because of its course. It starts from the nucleus ambiguous and then it supplies the pharynx and then it supplies the larynx and then it goes to form the esophageal plexus, then cardiac plexus, and then, you know, plexus around the pleura, and then celiac plexus. All these plexus are formed by vagus. So, since it goes up to the transverse colon, transverse colon, it is called the longest cranial nerve. Next one. Trochlear nerve has the longest intracranial course. So you must remember trochlear. What does the trochlear supply? The trochlear supply SO4 muscle, which is this superior oblique, is supplied by fourth cranial nerve, trochlear. So it passes through superior orbital fissure to enter the eye. So it starts at the brain stem. It has the longest intracranial course. Okay, next one. Abducent nerve has longest course through subarachnoid space. So you must remember, abducent nerve has longest course through a subarachnoid space. 
So you please read the question. What exactly they are asking? Have they asked about intracranial? Have they asked about extracranial? And where the course exactly? Is it subarachnoid? Which course they are asking? Or simply if the question is very plain, longest cranial codes, then you have to go with the answer vagus. So it depends on what question is asked. So these are the other questions that could be asked in a similar manner. Okay, next one. Hypoglossal nucleus of the medulla located in which ventricle? So now you know that the hypoglossal nucleus is whether it is in the second ventricle, is it there is something called second ventricle? Absolutely no. Third ventricle, it is present, but is it hypoglossal nucleus present? So they are talking about medulla. Where is third ventricle? Third ventricle is not in medulla. It is in cerebrum. So it has got nothing to do with that. So it is wrong answer. Top of the vent fourth ventricle, floor of the fourth ventricle. There is no top of the fourth ventricle because that is occupied by peduncle. So you know that the you know, this is the fourth ventricle. This is how the fourth ventricle looks like. This is the cerebellum. This is the fourth ventricle. This portion is the floor. This is the floor of the, this is the pons. So if you look at this, you can see this is the floor and uh, this portion is divided into first part and this is the second part. There are two triangles. This is called hypoglossal trigone. And this portion is called vagal trigone, where the vagus nuclei is present. So hypoglossal nuclei is present in the upper portion. So that is in the floor of the fourth ventricle only but it is in the upper portion. So that the answer is D. Most of you think it is D. Aishwarya says D and Hare Krishna says it is D. Yeah, it is correct. So this is the explanation you must remember. See, this is another picture where you can see superior, inferior colliculars. You can see peduncles, middle cerebellar, inferior cerebellar peduncles. And you can also see the, this is where the, sulcus is present. You can see the two triangles here. This is exactly where the hypo the fourth ventricle is. The fourth ventricle is here and this portion is occupied by the cerebellum. Now there is hypoglossal trigone and vagal trigone. Okay. So we were talking about hypoglossal trigone. It is the floor of fourth ventricle. Okay, next one. In the upper part of the medulla oblongata, you know that hypoglossal nuclei, it approaches the rhomboid fossa. So what is the other name for this hypoglo the fourth ventricle? It is also called rhomboid fossa. Remember this word, rhomboid fossa. And uh, that is the name for floor of the fourth ventricle. Next the hypoglossal nerve supplies motor innervation to all the muscles except. Now, first of all, you tell me whether hypoglossal is a motor, sensory or both. What is it? Is it motor, sensory or both? Who knows this answer? Here, Hypoglossal nerve supplies motor innervation to all the muscles except the tongue. So the answer here is palatoglossus. 
Yes, Puja says motor. Yes, it is purely motor. Okay, so it supplies only the muscles. So we are talking about which muscle? All the there are what are the tongue muscles? Genio glosses. Then there is stylo. Io. And these are the extrinsic. Plus, it also supplies the intrinsic. What are the intrinsic muscles? We have longitudinal, superior, longitudinal, inferior, longitudinal, vertical, and transverse. So all these muscles are supplied by hypoglossal nerve. Okay, all together, you have four here and then you have four here. All these muscles are supplied by the hypoglossal nerve. But palatoglossus is not supplied by hypoglossal. It is supplied by vagus. Anybody knows which nerve? It is vagus through pharyngeal plexus. Okay, I hope I'm uh, making things clear to you. All right. Next one. See, all the muscles of the tongue, that is both intrinsic as well as extrinsic, are all supplied by the hypoglossal nerve, except the palatoglossus which is supplied by pharyngeal plexus. You have the sensory part. The sensory part is not at all by hypoglossal nerve. It is completely by lingual and corda tympani. Corda tympani is special sensory. And this one is general sensory. And you also have parasympathetic fibers that is also present. So this is a very important slide. You must remember the nerve supply. Nerve supply of tongue is very, very important. Very, very important from exam point of view. Okay, let's move on to the next one. The accessory nerve exits from which foramen in the skull? Now you have, uh, we are talking about which nerve now this is. Which nerve is this? This is the 11th cranial nerve. So you can also call this a spinal accessory. The answer is the jugular foramen. Why? Because there are three things. 9th, 10th and 11th cranial nerve which exit out through jugular. What passes through foramen? Oh, well, anybody knows? See, I always mentioned that whenever we do the MCQs, Always all the options are considered and each explanation is given to all the options. Now, why this is not the answer, we have to know. So that next time if there is a question from this one, we will be able to answer. So now here, the answer is C, of course. But why not A? Why it is not A? It is male, M-A-L-E, mandibular nerve, accessory meningeal artery, Lesser petrosal nerve and emissary vein. What passes through lesser rum? Anybody? Just the fibrous tissue. Just the fibrous tissue passes through that. Next you have uh, foramen magnum. What are the things that is passing? You have the various important things plus spinal cord. You have meninges. Then spinal arteries that is anterior plus posterior spinal arteries, medulla oblongata, and some ligaments. These are the structures passing through the foramen magnum. So here the answer is C. Yes, Puja says it is C. 
Krishna says it is C and Rishabh says it is C. So, all um, the answers are correct. Okay, next one. Okay, we'll move to the next one. Before we move to the next one, let's see. Give me a second. All right. So now here I want to just correct this. Okay. You have this diagram where you can see the glossopharyngeal, vagus and accessory. Three, the, all these, this is the anterior portion. This is the anterior. This is the middle portion. And this is the posterior portion of the jugular foramen. So now you can see that there is this dysphagia this dysphagia and hoarseness of voice is because of damage to which nerve you tell me which nerve puja any idea which nerve hoarseness so we are talking about larynx dysphagia we are talking about pharynx right so which one do you think this is for which nerve vagus Next, we have loss of gag reflex. This is because of which now? Yes, Hare Krishna says it is because of vagus. Loss of gag reflex is because of which one? It is the ninth cranial nerve that is glossopharyngeal. Next, shoulder dysfunction. That is, I mentioned that it is drooping of the shoulder tip. That is because of spinal History. And this is what is called Vernet's syndrome. If the patient exhibits all these symptoms, then you call this as Vernet syndrome or jugular foramen syndrome. Okay, we'll move to the next one. Spinal part of accessory nerve supplies which muscles? Now there are various muscles, but the combination is what we are looking at. It supplies two muscles, that is for sure. The axillary nerve also supplies two muscles. Spinal accessory also supplies two muscles. Which one is this one supplying? Deltoid and teres minor, right? And which one spinal accessory supplies? It supplies two muscles. Which are they? Anyone who has an idea which muscles they supply? Dandeep says sternocleidomastoid and trapezius. Yes, you're right. Yes, you're right. Hare Krishna also says A, A, most of you say it is A, okay. So, it is not serratus anterior and this is by long thoracic nerve. Okay, all these others are supraclavicular nerve. So, this is not the one, this is scalene, they are all supraclavicular. Okay, so this is the one, first one option A. Okay, let's see. See what happens in case of uh, spinal accessory nerve injury. Now, you know that spinal accessory nerve is special visceral efferent. Okay, it is special visceral efferent. Now, its distribution is to these two muscles. That is motor distribution. So, you can see them. This is what we were talking about the other time. The fourth ventricle. This is fourth ventricle. Okay, this is fourth ventricle. So now here you very close to that you can see all these nerves, how it emerges out. You can see the spinal accessory and if you see the motor evaluation of that, it supplies these two muscles. We can check the integrity of this nerve by inspecting the function of these two. See what has happened to this lady's shoulder. 
she is inability to rotate the head to the other side because sternocleidomastoid will help in rotation of head she is not able to rotate her head if you want to check trapezius how would you check by asking the patient to elevate the arm that is not possible the shoulder stays drooped the shoulder is drooped downwards and adducted hand perfectly so now you can see that it is there is adduction of the hand and shoulder is also drooped instead of straight it is drooped it is drooped okay so this is the answer for or this is the test for these two nerves next one which of the following nerve commonly injured during removal of malignant lymph nodes in the posterior triangle now there are malignant lymph nodes in the posterior triangle which tri which lymph nodes do you think are there in the posterior triangle have you heard of supraclavicular supraclavicular lymph nodes are present so if these nodes are enlarged it can lead or it can be detected as a condition that is on either side of the neck hodgkins hodgkins lymphoma okay that is detected as hodgkins lymphoma okay next one you have this uh, nerve they are asking about which nerve is commonly injured now which one do you think is commonly injured in this case what is the content of the triangle let's see what is the content is vagus present is vagus present not present is hypoglossal present no is cranial root no spinal root yes so the answer is d puja says d dandeep says d krishna says d all this say d so let's see the answer yes you can see there is a nerve that goes transversely across the sternocleidomastoid this was one of the questions that is transverse cervical there is one that goes upwards that is the lesser auricular the lesser occipital then there is great auricular nerve that is going towards the angle of the mandible it supplies the angle of the mandible it supplies sensory to the angle of the mandible which one i'm talking about great auricular nerve and here the question is what are the contents of this triangle that is the posterior triangle you can see the posterior triangle content you have brachial plexus you have supraclavicular nerve and you have lymph nodes that is supraclavicular lymph nodes occipital artery you can see homohyoid dividing the triangle into upper and lower triangle this is what is the name of this triangle this is homohyoid triangle this is the other triangle the upper triangle in the posterior region okay this is one triangle this is one that is divided by homohyoid but we are talking about the nerve which nerve we are talking about the one which is a content that is spinal accessory now you can see the spinal accessory which is present in this region okay we'll move to the next one so now hypoglossal nerve is a what kind of a nerve is that uh, we have already mentioned the answer 
we went to this question we uh, in one first or second slide and it was little different so you can expect the question little twisted turns and modified so hypo it need not be a straight question all the time right so you have hypoglossal nerve what type of a nerve is this is this the motor type is the sensory type or both which type it is we know that it supplies intrinsic plus extrinsic muscles so since it supplies just the muscles we know that it is a motor type this is the answer so who mentions the answer vidya shri gudela says it is motor type okay so you can see that it takes origin from medulla it supplies all the muscles of the tongue except palatoglossus which is supplied by the plexus and then you have dysfunction of this nerve can always result in unilateral lesions can cause a paresis that is dumbness on the tongue atrophy of the tongue you can see furrowing of the tongue and you can also see that the affected side it is tilted to the affected side like this because the unopposed action of the genioglossus on the opposite side so it is tilting to the affected side so this is the test for hypoglossal nerve you can also check the strength of the tongue protrusion can be check protrusion of tongue can be checked by asking the patient to protrude the tongue and keep it in protruded position for some time and that is done by genioglossus and that is supplied by hypoglossal nerve so this is a very easy uh, easily observable test and uh, you will not go wrong so that's why this test is used protrusion of the tongue to check the strength of the tongue muscle okay now i request all of you to kindly follow and also put a like so that you know i can make more and more such videos for mcqs and keep you very active and interacted during the class and all these mcqs are with explanation so all these explanations give you lot of information not just for one of the options but for all the four options you have an explanation so that way it's not out of one question you are not getting just one answer you are getting four answers so if we are discussing about 10 questions you are getting about 40 answers so 40 answers in a day is actually lots so this you can get with my youtube at 6 pm class you can have special class attending that is at 7:30 and then i have one more class that is at 9:30 which is again full of mcqs so you can attend this you can attend this that is also of mcqs it is high yielding and you will definitely high yielding why i mention is because you will definitely be benefited all this is something like a take home so once you have understood you, you will retain it for a very long time so you will never forget the action of hypoglossal nerve because it is explained with a picture it is all clinical based so it is all clinical based and scenario based questions so you will never ever miss anything so it's very very important that you attend all such uh, clinical based questions so we have um, kamlesh dandeep hari krishna vidyashri pooja all of you participating in a very nice manner we also had uh, rishab for some time and then we had uh, yeah we had preeti baska for some time aishwarya for some time so just don't go away stay tuned till the end of the class so that you can extract maximum so you will have to extract maximum and all this is a glimpse of what you can get in your subscriptions that is through the subscriptions for your classes they are called 
so you have now special classes going on youtube classes going on and you have some paid classes paid subscriptions are present so please go for all these subscriptions and get 100 percent you can use the code r-o-h-i-n-i to get even more information and update your knowledge okay we'll see one last question that is about the fibrous joint which of the following is a fibrous joint you have so many joints in your body now we have intercarpal intervertebral plantar occipital manubriosternal inferior tibiofibula so now fibrous joints are called fixed joints they are not fixed joints remember f for fixed this is one category then we also have cartilaginous joints and then we have synovial type joints Now, fixed joints is something that does not no movement. Here you have slight movement. And then you have free movement. Okay. So, you have to mention which one is a fibrous or a fixed joint. Let's see the options there. Someone says intervertebral. We just she thinks it is intervertebral. But it is a cartilaginous joint. Intervertebral is a secondary cartilaginous joint. So it is not a fibrous. It is a cartilaginous joint. Anyone else? I'll give you the explanation why it is not or why it is so. Atlanto occipital is what type of joint is this? This is a synovial joint. What about manubrio sternal? This is also cartilaginous. What about intercarpal? This is a synovial joint. This is a plain joint in the synovial. Secondary cartilaginous joint. This is a synovial joint which is a pivot type of joint. So what is left? We are left with just one option. Gandhip is wrong. It is not manubrio sternal. Gandhip, you are wrong. It is not manubrio sternal. It is a cartilaginous joint. Manubrio sternal is a cartilaginous joint. Okay, it does move. It does move. During your respiration, it does move. But it has a slight movement. Okay. Now the answer is inferior tibia and fibula. I don't think anybody knew this. This is the inferior tibiofibular joint. So now here we have all these skull sutures are fibrous, distal tibiofibular. This is what we were talking about. Radio ulnar, posterior part of sacroiliac. All these are fibrous. Then we have cartilaginous. Somebody mentioned intervertebral so this one so manubrio sternal all these are secondary cartilaginous who mentioned dandeep mentioned this right dandeep you said this and uh, intervertebral was told by vidya correct so that is wrong that is wrong okay so this is the answer that is distal tibiofibular joint so we have entered the last slide this is this is the last slide and i thank everyone for joining in and watch for more classes like this please like and subscribe follow me at ro aqua and don't forget to like the video once you have light i will get motivated to post even more thank you so much and good night